Well, good morning. It's a privilege again to be able to uh, spend a little time in God's Word this morning with you. I I hope that you are able to take the time to watch Sunday School this morning. We're trying to get some sense of normality back, and uh, this past uh, past week we prayed about it, and uh, we tried to open things up a little bit more, and uh, it was good to see nearly 100 people in the auditorium, and so... Uh, if you're watching this morning, you know that we've set Sunday School back to 9.30. Uh, that way you can watch Sunday School in your home and then uh, go to uh, church uh, there at Lighthouse at, uh, at 11 o'clock. And so uh, by God's grace, I'll be preaching uh, this morning at 11 o'clock. And we look forward to seeing you there if, if, uh, if you're up to it. And if you're having health problems or you're uncomfortable with being in a setting where we've got... Uh, We've got uh, quite a few people. We are going to social distance. And uh, now I've heard some complain they don't like having their temperature taken or or they don't want to uh, sign a waiver. But uh, I'm doing my best to try and comply with the mandates of the state. And if we would have someone to get sick because of coming to church, if it could be proved that way, then we've done everything that we can do. And uh, it, it helps us as far as our health department not shutting us down. Uh, I know that this uh, past uh, two weeks ago, uh, Brother Luke's church up in Pennsylvania, they had COVID-19 end up, people getting sick in their church. They shut them down for two weeks, and then they just had someone else get sick, so they're shutting them down for another two weeks. That's in the state of Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm doing my best to try and, and, and make it to where we can come, social distance, uh, still get people into the house of God. We can be able to preach. And start start seeking for a sense of normality. Uh, we're still having our homecoming day on the 9th. I really ask you to pray. Um, Brother Luke had an injection in his back last Monday, and uh, he's meeting with a surgeon this Monday coming. Uh, it looks like that he's going to require surgery, but it looks like it's not going to be as evasive as we thought it might be. And so uh, he really needs your prayer. He, You know, he wants to be in church. He wants to be able to take part. Uh, this past week, after having the injection, he tried to give those few minutes each night to vacation Bible school, sit on a stool for just those few minutes, and then he would lie right, right down. And so uh, uh, at this moment in time, they're, Becky and Luke and the kids are still staying out our way out on our property. And so I need you to really pray for him. Pray for Becky also. Becky had an injection on, uh, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday morning, and uh, her brother took her in. And, uh, and she did pretty good on Thursday, but, uh, but on Friday she was having problems again. So they said to give it about uh, three days and we're hoping that it'll give her some relief in her neck where she could then meet with the other surgeon and uh, have her surgery on her gallbladder at the end of the month. So uh, we do have some needs, especially in our staff right now. Uh, we're still planning on uh, starting for school. I wanna thank everyone that participated in the in the uh, business meeting and uh, we've got the school just about the, the just about finished up as far as the four years concerned and uh, I praise God that uh, it's it's paid for uh, we've got just a few things to do we've got lights to put up a few things like that other than that we're ready to go so uh, we're preparing for school we're preparing for the end of the summer and uh, and we're preparing to get back in church and and uh, let's start meeting together on the ninth and we'll have a a lunch and, and uh, some preaching in the afternoon also. And then uh, we'll start having services every week. We'll have our Sunday school in our church in, in at Lighthouse. Uh, we'll still be meeting online on Sunday night and Wednesday nights for just a little while until we adjust and see how people do with uh, the social distancing and how our congregation comes as far as to the house of God. Uh, I do covet your prayers. And I'd ask that you pray with me and pray for me and uh, pray for our staff. Uh, pray for Brother uh, Aaron, who will be coming home here in just a week or so. And uh, it will be so good to have him back. And then uh, I want to thank all of you that have served, stepped in, stepped in and stepped up and uh, has helped in so many ways. We started last week in the book of Luke, chapter uh, 22. We're dealing with conversion. And if you remember what conversion means, conversion is the outward manifestation of regeneration. In other words, it's the evidence of being saved. And uh, I was actually reading a book this week uh, by an author that I really enjoy and I've read throughout the years. And he was talking about the different types of meetings in a church uh, and how that we put it off. Oftentimes we put our 
emphasis on the uh, the edification of the believer. And uh, we have the breaking of bread, the different types of meetings. But the primary one is always the evangelization. And and uh, it, it pricked my heart because I thought, you know, that's the true evidence of conversion. The true evidence of conversion is not the fact that you come to church to hear preaching, but that you yourself are involved in not just setting, but evangelizing, reaching others for the cause of Christ. So conversion is that outward manifestation of regeneration. Regeneration means to be regened. In other words, the gen genetics that make up Howard Caldwell are flawed. They're flawed by birth because of sin. And that's the position we're in, in uh, when we're born. And so when I got regenerated, I was regened. I received the, the Spirit of God who indwelled me. And he is the one who commands all praise be given to our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, I, I, as a born-again Christian, I myself... I had to have a transformation. I had to be transformed inside. It's not just the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's the transformation that takes place, that I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. And, uh, and conversion is the decision physically to choose to do right. Uh, it means to turn about, a change of purpose, to change direction. Uh, turning around to be used in the spiritual way. It's not about me, it's about him. And that's what conversion is. The condition of the born-again person needing conversion, if you'll remember, we dealt with it, the born-again, uh, when he's first saved, is carnal. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear. We dealt with 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, and I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So we start off our Christian walk as a baby, just like a natural birth. The spiritual birth takes place, and, and there is not any maturity there. Uh, we need conversion. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 19, the Bible says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, uh, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Uh, conversion uh, is necessary for the born-again believer. Uh, we have dealt with it for the months and months, dealing with the authority of God, God giving that authority, the change that so must take place, that battle that must we must win in the mind, how that the mind has to be transformed on a daily basis, how that our heart cannot be trusted, how that our heart has to be listened once we've settled in our mind to do that which is right. Our heart is then lent. It's given over to the needs of uh, the Holy Spirit to do what His will is through us. That's what... Following the will of God is. That's what the surrender of uh, our will to the Lord is. Uh, the, remember, the conversion is that na a gradual process as a believer is converted from a, being a weak Christian to that which is strong in the Lord, that which can take on meat. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fell not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So that brings us to our second point. The purpose of conversion is that the converted uh, becomes the converter. Uh, I, God saved me to, to convert others, uh, to be an example to my life and through the evidence of the Spirit of God in me that we might be an influence on other people. Uh, it's a natural progress. It's what we dealt with last Sunday morning, even in the preaching, that God fills in those gaps, fills in those stations as people pass on and go to heaven, that God sees someone, listen, we see someone get saved, and then that person become converted, and they themselves become a converter, and they step into the gap. And uh, that's a healthy church, and we're going to actually deal with that this morning in our preaching hour. So we dealt with the purpose of conversion is that the converted become the converter. John 15, 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit, sh fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. That's what it's all about. For the converted to become the converter. And we want that to happen progressively as fast as possible. Uh, one of the things that I was convicted of this past week was the fact that, you know, it's very easy to just enjoy our fellowship with the believers. Uh, 
one of the members was sharing with me the fact that uh, you know they were having a new baby and and there's there's their their firstborn uh, there was their jealousy they they didn't want to have another baby in the house they, they liked the attention they didn't think it was necessary and so you know I sometimes I think that we're like that as Christians as church you know we've got our Sunday school class we've got our people we enjoy our fellowship with one another but that is not what we're here for we're here to edify one another but that process of the converted becoming the converter is sp supposed to be taking place in everybody's life. Everybody's growing at a different stage, but we should all be growing and we can't fool around about it because if we start off by setting, then what we'll do, we'll sit and watch everybody else go forward for the Lord, but we won't grow. And I think far too often times in our churches, we have people that are bored again, but not converted. And so uh, that is our goal. Our goal is to... Uh, to listen to one another, uh, especially those that are mature in the Lord. Uh, I don't, I have no goal to offend or to hurt. That's not my goal. Uh, oftentimes when we bring things up that may be negative to, to a brother or sister in Christ, new convert in the Lord, it's not that we're trying to offend. We're trying to uh, encourage them to realize that, hey, listen, you need to see yourself through the light of the, the gospel to the light of Jesus Christ, that every one of us in our, our, the rest of our lives in this flesh, in this, in our, this body, uh, I'm going to have to be overcoming this flesh daily through the power and influence of the Holy Spirit, and I will never stop growing. If I, now listen, if I go to heaven today, uh, I will have still had space to grow because I dwell in this flesh, and I cannot trust it. So the purpose of conversion uh, is that the converted becomes the converter. And today, I want to spend some time with you. In the time that we have allowed, I want to deal with the responsibility of the converted. Uh, this is getting down to the brass tacks of the thing. And I'm going to approach it from a way so you understand why it's so important for us to not only have the local church, but that we, through the local church, understand our responsibility a redemption is the work of who? Who redeems us? Well, you say, that's easy, preacher. We're redeemed through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely, redemption was the work and responsibility of Jesus. The God the Father sent him that he might be our propitiation, that he might be our substitute, that he might purchase us back. That is the job and responsibility of the Lord Jesus Christ. Regeneration, then, who regenerates us? Who has the responsibility? You said, well, it's of course God. Well, we know that we have the Trinity and they're three in one and, and we understand that, but there's a, a specific responsibility given. A regeneration is the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, that perfect gene dominates that imperfect gene, which is Howard. So when the Holy Spirit moves in, I receive the power of God, Acts chapter 2. I receive, listen, I receive the influence and the character of Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that glorifies the name of Jesus. So redemption is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit. Then we come into Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So who's the one that justifies us? If Jesus redeems us and the Holy Spirit regenerates us, then who justifies us? Of course, God the Father, because it's his, listen, it's his justice. It's his judgment that has to be satisfied by the redemptive work of his son. Well, we know that Jesus did his work. He fulfilled his work. We know that the Holy Spirit has indwelled. And listen, the Holy Spirit is the one that will leave with me when Howard leaves this body. Uh, right now, he indwells me. And, uh, and as long as I have the Holy Spirit, and I always will, I am now a son of God, a child of God. And when listen, when God calls me out, it's the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that takes me to heaven, then I'm justified. That means I'm, I'm perfect. I'm perfect in the sight of God the Father. That justifi justification is the work of the Father. And he declares the sinner righteous 
uh, through, the, through his son. That's what he's saying there. Therefore being justified by faith. So when I put my trust in God, I'm saying the blood of Jesus Christ, it satisfies the judgment and justice of God. That's good stuff, isn't it? Well, if redemption is the work of Jesus Christ and regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit and justification is the work of God the Father, then whose responsibility is conversion? I mean, that's what we're down to, right? then conversion becomes the work, now listen, of the church. It's not just about us assembling together. It's just not about us joining together. And God knows my heart. I, I have missed us being able to serve and operate as a machine that's, that's that an organism that's alive for the cause of Christ. I have missed it. But... Perhaps in, in many ways, this has been healthy. It gives us a fresh appreciation. Perhaps it's time for us to get back to the foundation of what we're all about. Because it's not about sitting, listening to preaching. It's not about just going to a Sunday school class. It's not just about a great commission evening. It's about us helping each other to be what we need to be through our salvation, our growth, our talents, our gifts, that we can be totally functional in our position. Uh, how do we do that, preacher? Well, it kind of starts, and a lot of it you can find over there in the book of James, it kind of starts with the proper use of, of this, the tongue. Uh, <clears throat> this is the thermometer that tells how I'm converting. Am I to a position I can be a converter? Uh, this is the gauge and thermometer of what's going on in here. That's that's translated to here in, in, in my heart. Uh, it's the barometer that shows my my willingness on a consistent basis to surrender myself, to humble myself, to serve others. Uh, the Bible says there in James chapter 3, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. So my natural, my natural person, that person that was born in sin, there's nothing that good can come from this tongue. This tongue has to listen. This tongue has to be influenced by the spirit that's in me, who's influenced the conscience and the will of Howard Caldwell to the point and place that I surrender that will and that conscience to the Holy Spirit of God. That my conversation, my goals, what I think then is produced through this right here, that which is righteous and godly. Uh, it should convict us. It convicts me. I was having a conversation this morning with uh, Pastor Shope and, and my son Jason. We were discussing, like all of us are doing at this point in time, the matters around the world. And it's very easy to get caught up in the excesses of the media, uh, the news, social media. It seems like that it's excessive. You understand where I'm coming from, that what people are repeating is, is the conspiracy theories, the extremes with Black Lives Matter, the, the horrific uh, things that are taking place and happening on, uh, on, on one side out there in the world and then in the other side, it's the despair and the fear and the hopelessness of people. And we see all that. We don't see the blessings. We don't see the families that are going right on. We don't see the farmers still out there on their tractors 
plowing under the earth or, or tending their crops across the Midwest. We do not see the souls that are being saved as a consequence of the fears of men. We, we're not seeing that. We're inundated with the excess. And what people are saying who are born again, who are Christian, the banner they're waving, well, is it the banner of, of Christianity? Is it the banner of Christ likeness? Uh, it convicts me. I, I get convicted about even what comes out of my mouth when I catch myself um, watching something or hearing something or reading something, and all of a sudden I'm drawn into the excess of, of the world, uh, that despair, that hopelessness. Uh, I am a spiritual creature. Not, not. I'm spiritual. I'm a spiritual man. This moment, if I this flesh dies, this flesh gives up. A ghost. Uh, I'm in the presence of God, and the very nature of God goes with me. Nothing left in this shell. There will be no life in this body. And so, it's very important for us as Christians to remember. Listen, I love the United States of America, but my home is in heaven. My purpose is the salvation of the lost and to glorify God through being a converter to those that need converted. Uh, I, I pray that you understand and agree, and, and I pray that you will uh, allow the, like book, the book of James chapter 3 to convict your heart, not only by what you read, but what you say, but what you do. Is what you're doing what you're saying? What you're transferring to your children or your grandchildren, is it is it Christ-like? Is it an instrument tool that can bring glory to God? Is that what it does? I ask you the question. Secondly, is the proper use of our life. You go back one chapter, you go back to James chapter 2, verse 20, the Bible says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works, whom he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by faith, faith uh, by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. That's the proper use of your life. I have the imputed righteousness given to me. That means that God gave me a credit card you can't outspend. I love that illustration. I use it often. So if God gave me his righteousness and it's imputed to me, then his faith that he gave me so that righteousness might work, it produces works. And the works are eternal works. That's the position he put me in. So what was my life to be used for? Am I, am I uh, uh, just a soldier to stand up for the constitutional rights of America or the Bill of Rights? How about the, how about the truth of the Word of God? How about the need of every man to be born again? I don't think I separate them. I, I don't think you have to. I think to be a Christian, I should be that individual who brings, listen, brings hope and peace to others. My, my job is not to stir you up to rebellion. Most of us, we're rebellious as it begins with. It's, most of us want to be angry. We want to lash out. We want to defend. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with defending our country. My, my dad fought for this country. Uh, my family has always been... Uh, uh, people that were willing to pay their part and pay their price to be the system we have. And I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in, in everything that our country at one time stood for. But I also know that the answer is not right now. My, the answer is for me to give the gospel, to be to preach the gospel. For me, listen, for me to encourage and give others hope. And I need, to use pro I need to properly use the faith that God has given me. Uh, I do not want to turn others away from the gospel simply because 
I, I feel like that I have to be militant. Uh, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm broken heart over our country. There may come a time and place where we each and every one have to stand up and say, I will not. This is truth. I will not do it. Uh, but right now, uh, may we show this world that the church of Jesus Christ is unified and we're not afraid and we're at peace in our hearts. May, may the cross of Christ, may it be the place that we gather around and join hands because of the redemptive work of the Lord. It's a proper use of our life, the proper use of our tongue. Uh, James chapter 2, verse 8. If you take the time and you want to turn to it there in your Bible, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, now what is that royal law? It's whatever missionary goes to the field to do. That's the royal law. It's what every Christian goes to his job and tries to do. It's what every born-again Christian that goes out into the street attempts to do. If he fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. I don't agree with the governor of the state of Virginia. I don't think I agree with him on anything he says. In fact, I abhor what he says. I despise what he says. As far as I'm concerned, he condones, encourages the murder of the unborn. I don't agree with him on Constitution. I don't agree with him on the Second Amendment, the First Amendment. I don't agree what he's done to the churches here in the state of Virginia. I don't. I, I can't think of one thing that I agree with the man on, not one. But I also don't want to give him cause to look at me and see in me the same character of the world. That is not my goal. My Bible tells me that if I fulfill the royal law, I'll love my neighbors myself. That's what it says. The Bible says if I'll do that, it says, Howard, you do well. Think about this. The Apostle Paul is martyred for the cause of Christ. When he went to Rome, did he go there to accuse or to go there to be a witness? What did he bear with him? What was the banner that he took with him? It was the cross of Jesus Christ. It was the gospel of the Lord. I'm convinced this should be my message at this point in this time, for this hour, in this church, in this state, this time. I am totally persuaded. Uh, we have the, um, the parable of the sower. Take your Bibles with me and turn to Matthew chapter 13. I want to share something with you. And then we'll be done. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18, the Bible says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When he one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in, the heart, in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but earth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that received the seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receiveth seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also bear the fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Tremendous passage, tremendous par uh, parable that we can look upon. Now, remember, who redeems us? Jesus Christ. Who regenerates us? The Holy Spirit. Who justifies us? God the Father. So who's the responsibility of conversion? It's given to the local church. Now, if we take the time to look at this parable, it said that in verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. Uh, this is the one that received the incorruptible seed by the wayside. It's outside of the local church. 
I don't know where you stand on the local church, but if you're part of Lighthouse Baptist Church, there's a, there's a reason God organized the organism of the church. And its purpose is to draw people in to not only hear the gospel, but to get saved and then for the converted, converter to convert. That that one might, it's, it's the process of multiplication, not addition. It's that if everybody is not just sitting listening to preaching, but everybody's acting upon the scriptures, then listen, it's, many years ago, I can remember when I got, first got saved, uh, I had seen Billy Graham on the television. And I was, it troubled me when I didn't heard preachers preaching against Billy Graham. I, I didn't understand. But the, it's not what he said. He gave the gospel. Many people, hundreds of people, thousands of people have got saved under the gospel story given by Dr. Billy Graham. But what happened to all those people? What happened to all those saved? They ended up often by the wayside. Uh, they tried to set up, but they would say, go to your local, I mean, go to the nearest church to you, or they would have all these different denominations there. I just don't, I don't understand that. Why in the world would I want someone to get saved and then, as a newborn baby in Christ, not be put into a place where they could grow and mature under the same doctrine that saved them, that now can keep them. It's like having a baby and leaving it out next to the dumpster. Or putting it on a diet that it cannot, cannot grow through, that it cannot, cannot uh, mature. No, that's what it's talking about here. They receive the incorruptible seed by the wayside, but they're outside of the local church. It, the Bible says that then the uh, it, it, the Bible says then uh, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in the heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. They're outside of the local church. It's very important for us. To, uh, to be the church of unity that reaches into the community and shows them the love of the Lord Jesus Christ when we see them get saved. It's our, our, our responsibility just started. You have a baby, you go to the hospital, but from the hospital goes to the nursery of the hospital and then right to home. And from home, then all of a sudden your world's changed. You have a responsibility to raise that child. That's our responsibility. Secondly, in verse 20, it says, But he that receiveth the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and an with joy received it, yet hath he not root in himself. But dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, by and by he is offended. This is the one that received the incorruptible seed in himself. Um, I've heard people say, well, I don't need church. We, I worship God my way. I worship out in the woods. I, we worship in our home. I don't agree with any of the doctrines of the churches out there. Uh, I have my own religion, and my own religion's good enough. Uh, uh, you know, I believe just like my grandmother taught me or my, my mom and dad taught me. Eh, I'm sorry. But God, listen, God, Christ died for the church. When he says brother, and he's talking about the church, the church at Ephesus, church at Philippi, we're dealing with the churches. And so the local church is what God loves. That's what he died for. And so it's very important for us. It's very easy in my pride to think that what I think is the only way there is. No, uh -uh. no, that's why I'm accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm accountable to you as a congregation. You're accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're accountable to the brothers and sisters around you that you fellowship with and to me. It works. We work one another. Listen, I, 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 I had children, and now my children are growing and raising their children. And I can see the fruit of my training my children. Now, what kind of fruit is Lighthouse Baptist Church putting out? It's very important for you as a Christian. You say, well, I don't agree with anything you're doing right now, preacher. Well, that's your right to believe that. But is it drawing you away from the local church? No, you can't use me in excuse. Christ said you'd be in charge. For sake not to assembling yourselves together, you got people quoting that around, then why aren't you in church? Why aren't you supporting your church? Why aren't you a part of your church? When's the last time you won someone to the Lord Jesus Christ? Why, when's the last time God burdened you to help another brother and sister Christ? Why, when's the last time you was the converter converting someone? 
I am maybe, maybe meddling now, preacher. No, I'm preaching. That's what that comes down to. Uh, if you think that you think that your way in your house is the only way, then I promise you, I promise you, it's God says right here. Ye hath not root in himself, but doth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He that's always offended, I, I can guarantee you, he's not a soul winner. Probably not faithful in his tithe. Probably doesn't give to missions. He's just strong on opinion. Well, a person that just has opinion and no actions, I don't have much use for. No, I want somebody that's going to humble himself. As I t attempt to humble myself daily before the Lord and, and, and do that which is right in the sight of the Lord, sh so should you. Uh, church in the home never works. That's I'm doing big on college meetings. I never have been. Uh, they receive the incorruptible seed by the wayside. That's outside the local church. Then we see these that uh, try to have worship in their own homes and uh, they have their own religion. Then it says in verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. That's the unseparated church. There's no God-given authority there. And I, do, I do not believe in plurality of elders. What's that, preacher? That's one of the reasons we're teaching what we're teaching. You know, I want you to know what you believe. Uh, there's, it comes around about every 15 or 20 years. It's, you'll see a bunch of independent Baptist churches or churches that are sound their doctrine all of a sudden that uh, they've got a deacon board and all the authority is given to that board and the pastor's one voice in it. Well, the problem with that is, is that when something good happens, everybody wants to take the praise for it. When something bad happens, it's just the preacher's fault. That's plurality of elders. Uh, there can only be one father in the house. That's it. There's only one one God on the throne. Uh, there's only one daddy in a house. Uh, there's listen. There's only there's only one pastor in a church. The buck has to stop somewhere, and uh, that's the scriptural way that God has set it up. Uh, there's far too many that's unseparated in their churches, and there's no God given authority. The, the world plus church cannot bear fruit. So I believe in separation. I believe we ought to be different. Come out from among them and be ye separate. We should be different. We should be different in our speech and our looks, the way we carry ourselves. I say it over and over, we should be leaders. Christians should be leaders. So when I, I survey, I go into a church and I see it's an unseparated church. It's loosely bound, no God-given authority uh, then I know that doctrine of that church is not sound, not right. You say, well, uh, what you're saying is kind of a dying breed. Well, that's our fault then, because that's the scriptural way. You can't prove otherwise to me in the word of God. And then, thank God, we come down to the last one. We Verse 23, it says, But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. That's the local, visible, Bible-believing, living church. It sees, hears, understands, and produces fruit. That's what we're all about. As soon as people come to believe in the Lord, they should immediately start to help in preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. As soon as you get saved. I, I think the worst habit in the world to develop is a church that just sits and listens. We're to be a living, serving, working church. Uh, I don't want to develop any other type of church. I want to see the church become a church. This is the kind of church that preaches the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This requires conversion. It, convert, it requires the converted to become a converter. It requires the regeneration to be evidenced through choices that are righteous. That's what it's all about. God takes care of salvation. I can't add or take anything away from salvation. God's the one that saves. But you must decide if you want to live in the rags of this world or have the riches provided by the power of the word of God through conversion. That's your choice. You can be a member of the church or you can be a part of the church. The member and the part should be the same, but it's not always the case. Many people may have their name on the role of the Lighthouse Baptist Church. But have they ever been converted? 
And if they're being converted, are to are they to the point in place that they can convert others? Uh, I, we lose too many. I don't know about you, but I've watched people lose children. I watched it break down their hope. I've watched them separate as husband and wife. That's how a church dies. It's when we stop. Stop seeing births grow to maturity, become strong and healthy. Hey, I'm like many of you, you know, my, my battle, don't know how many more years I have that I can serve, but the time that I have, then whether it's as a father or as a grandfather, uh, whatever position God has for me, it's gonna be in the local church. By the grace of God, it's going to be working as a converter to convert others. I look forward to seeing you this morning. I hope we can be together in the house of God, and I'm hoping everything works out where we can have a great day in the Lord, and even that we could have lost people come visit. I know we have folks that are wanting to come that are not even members of our church, and may we pray for one another. Remember and lift up each other in the Lord. Father, bless now as we... Uh, Prepare for our preaching hour in just a little bit. Give traveling mercies to everyone that will come to church this morning. And Lord, we ask that your will be done. We know that everything is fluid and things have been changing day by day. And Lord, we give you this time. And Lord, may everybody understand that what I say, I say out of a heart that loves them. May they search the scriptures themselves. May they, may they, Father, communicate between you and themselves and the Holy Spirit that they might be convicted in their own lives of how they use their tongue, how their life is used, uh, what is produced through their life. Lord, may we judge ourselves, uh, lest the world judge us in an an unrighteous, ungodly way. And Father, we give you the praise and honor for all that's done in Jesus' name. Amen.